Hello and welcome back to this uh, yet another two-tailed hypothesis test uh, on a single population mean. Uh, so this one we're going to look at uh, farmers producing hay for nearby cattle ranchers. The hay is rolled into 50 pound bales and are sold by quantity. Therefore, when a rancher buys 100 bales of hay, they can expect to receive 5,000 pounds of hay. To ensure the cattle ranchers are getting what they expect, the farmer periodically samples batches of 30 hay bales that feels like a sample size, I'm going to circle that, to test to make sure that they're averaging 50 pounds. The most recent batch provided a sample weight of 49.1 pounds. Population standard deviation is 3.37 and we'll use a head level of significance of 0.05. Test to determine whether the farmer is producing what the ranchers are expecting. So the ranchers are expecting 50 pounds, we want to formulate that hypothesis in such a way that we can see is it equal to 50 pounds or is it not equal to 50 pounds. So again, two-tailed test. Uh, it's simply saying that we're producing what they are expecting. It's not saying are the, are, are the hay <laughs> are the bales of hay at least 50 pounds, no more than 50 pounds. Things like that would indicate that we're doing a one-tail test. Here we're, we're just testing, is it what they're expecting? So is it 50 pounds or is it not 50 pounds? Uh, alpha level of significance 0.05, comfortable with a 5% chance of committing a type 1 error. So there we have our our hypotheses. If our evidence supports the null hypotheses, then I can be comfortable that uh, we're not deviating from our goal of 50 pounds. Uh, if the evidence supports the alternative hypotheses, then we have a problem and we should uh, look into taking some course of action to fix this problem. Part B, test statistics. So again, we go to our formula sheet and we pull up this test statistic formula for a single population mean and then we're just going to put in our numbers 59 i mean 49.1 is our sample mean our hypothesized value is 50 sigma is 3.37 divided by the square root of our sample size was up here is 30. and now i'll just pull up my calculator and 49.1 minus 50 divided by 3.37 over uh, root 30. Negative 1.46. Okay, so there's our test statistic, negative 1.46. Use the p-value approach to draw a conclusion. Okay, so I need to go to my z-tables. And my z-value was negative 146. So here I find negative 1.4. And that second decimal place is 6. That's where those come together. I have 0 0.0721 is that area tail in that lower tail of the distribution. Now again, this is a two-tailed test. We always have to remember when we're doing two-tailed tests and only when we're doing two-tailed tests, we have to multiply that probability by two. So I'll have 0 0.0721 times two, and I have 0.1442. Actually, why don't I just write that over here? Our p-value is 0.1442. So there we go, that's our p-value. Draw our conclusion. Well, if I were to say I'm going to reject my exposure to a type 1 error is too big. Uh, I'm just too, it's, it's quite possible uh, to obtain that sample, that sample with a mean of 49.1 it's very possible that that sample came from a distribution with a mean of 50. Uh, and so because of that, I'm not going to reject. Because if I did reject, my exposure to a type 1 error is higher than what I'm comfortable with. And this is what that rejection rule is. That p-value has to be less than or equal to alpha in order for us to reject. If it's not, 
then our exposure to a type 1 error is too great, it's too high. I'm not comfortable with that. So we are going to reject. Uh, we are not going to reject. P-values greater than alpha, we are not going to reject. So our evidence here now supports the null hypotheses uh, that we are unable to say that we're deviating from our target of a uh, 50 pound bale of hay. Let's use the critical value approach. Okay, we've looked at this one a few times now, that critical value. So in this case, I'm going to reject if it is too large and we reject if it is too small. I want the size of the rejection space to be equal to alpha, which means that this area plus this area should be equal to alpha. So then we need the critical value that corresponds with half of alpha. So half of our rejection region is in each side of that distribution. And so here, we should have this one memorized by now. 0 0.025, right, because alpha is 0 0.05. Alpha divided by two is 0 0.025. So our critical value is 1.96, plus or minus 1.96, because we have the negative down here and we have the positive up here. So coming back to our problem with our z alpha by two is equal to plus or minus 1.96. And here I have a test statistic equal to negative 146. Sometimes I find it's easier to draw these rather than to to try to think of the rejection rule, right? The rejection rule is a little bit cumbersome. Uh, it looks something like this, right? So we can use this, and I can I can tell that well my my test statistic it's not larger than the positive, and it's not smaller than the than the negative. So we can still use that, but sometimes I find it's easier if we draw it. I know here's zero, here's one ninety six. I reject if it's up here. Here's negative 196, and we reject if it's down there. Everything in between, we do not reject. And so then I can go and find, well, my test statistic is negative 146. So that's somewhere right in here, which is in my do not reject space. So that's consistent with our results that we obtained using the p-value approach, as it should always be. Uh, so we're good. Our evidence supports the null hypotheses. We appear to be operating um, on spec, where we're meeting our objective um, uh, 50 pounds uh, in a bale of hay. Okay, good. That's all there is to it. I hope that that was helpful. Thanks again for watching. Bye-bye.